here we are, James and James interviews Club King Mario Diaz. Hi, honey bun. Hi, James, darling James. So we've got a big movie out. Yes, it's very exciting. Club King? Club King, that's mm. what it's called. Who is the director? His uh, name is John Bush. John Bush. Very talented, amazing uh, filmmaker. At first I was very hesitant. It seemed very very awkward to be asked to be the subject of a documentary, or feel worthy of but a documentary. But you are a, claim, you are a fame whore from way back. I can't imagine that you thought about it for too well, long. At least I, we got the horror part, right? <laughs> it, it follows your 20 year career, 20 plus years at this point, 20, right? 20 plus years, yes. And it starts back in the 1990s uh, at the Cock which yeah. was uh, a revolutionary club at the time. Thank you. Because what was happening in the 90s was Giuliani, he was trying to clean up New York. A lot of the adult themed businesses, the exotic dance uh, venues, a lot of the places where you know there were sex workers and uh, any kind of sexuality, particularly gay. And along comes the cock which was a little tiny little dive bar in the East Village. It was like an oasis from all that. It was where you were able to escape. I'd been promoting parties in the East Village, uh, started promoting with Mistress Formica. We did events at a little bar called Cake, oh, uh, yeah, deep in Alphabet Cake. City. That uh -huh. was the beginning of it all for us. Uh, you know, I was just trying to bring back the New York that I dreamt of, that I imagined was waiting for when me. You were a little kid growing up in Seattle, yeah. and you wanted to, you, you dreamed of this crazy I did. Life. I dreamt of the city, and I, you know, I read about the 70s underground and the leather scene. Oh, very, yeah, you know, uh -huh. all of the good stuff. The and, of Finland stuff <laughs> that you jerk off to in exactly. your bedroom. And when I got to New York, I felt like all of that was sort of slipping away. Like all the back rooms had shut down. You know, I started throwing some in your face, wild, sexy parties. There was famously a back room there where yes. anything goes and yeah. you could. It sort do of brought you the back room back. Uh, I was never <laughs> allowed back in that back room. Every time I walked in, everyone would be like, ew, James, get out. People really did need places to connect. I mean, it was a very, uh, very, being gay was a subversive act in itself. Till this day, there's something about this sort of, you know, off in a bush somewhere. Yeah, being yeah, in a dark that alley. To me, somewhere. Yes. I remember when gay sex was wrong and naughty and dirty and bad, and that was the best sex I ever had. <laughs> also at the cock, it's interesting because that's sort of where your family, the Mario Diaz family, began. That's yeah. where Jackie beat. You guys first became friends. That's where Justin Vivian Bond, uh, who is Justin. An, I just a god. Yeah, I felt like I just scored getting to work with Justin. Yeah. Jackie is somebody who is just legendary on an international yes. scale. She's so amazing. And talk a little bit about your relationship with her. She is, uh, she's my dearest, my, she's my best friend, my wifey, I call her at times. She came into the bar one night with a cassette tape, asked if she could do a number. I threw it in and let Jackie do her thing and it was, it was over from there. I was like, this, this one is special. I've always said I was raised by a pack of drag queens and you know, she's the one that really took me under. To me, there has never been any valleys. Like you have been on top for 20 years now. That just, nobody has that kind of luck. I mean, I always knew the cock had a shelf life. When I started, I knew full well that it was gonna run its course and at some point I would have to walk away. And that's one thing about life is it will always throw you change. You have to be ready to accept it or create it when necessary. I think some people, it's easy to scoff at nightclubs, but uh, it's my business and I take it seriously. You're a little OCD. <laughs> we have a clip that shows you going through your drawers, showing what you get, how you dress your dancers. Okay. And we'll play that right now. Let's see what I got here. Costume room is a disaster. It's like a drag queen exploded in my guest room, which is essentially my costume room. It is it is organized, although at the moment it looks like a nightmare. But we have a suspender drawer, we have a leather drawer, we have a ski cap drawer, we have military hats, wrestling masks, and some theme head pieces, jock straps, G-strings, 80s workout, gloves, Old gold is exploding on the floor, but there is actually a gold drawer, a gauze drawer, which is basically like when I do hospital, you know? I like some injured guys, I think it's really hot. Loads of 70s disco. Now I gotta get ready. 
and we're back. <laughs> I started doing it in New York when I threw Studio Filthy Whore and I was getting into themes and sets and I was really doing costuming and I really started to play with those ideas. I continued on in Los Angeles with Hot Dog where I'd oh, have oh, a scene. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, uh -huh. you know, you, you do need seven construction worker hats because all your go-go girls and boys are gonna be wearing them. And the de it's in the details, you know? There's one scene in there where you are furious <laughs> because the guy is wearing three <laughs> rubber bands and so three black rubber bracelets instead of the 12. Yes. And you're having a fit and you're crying <laughs> and you're upset because he ruined the whole night. <laughs> okay, it wasn't that bad. You Honestly. want 12 rubber bands, not three, oh, God it damn it. Been 12. It was supposed to be a cuff. <laughs> What's, you know, it's like a, there's a big difference between a cuff and just a couple of pieces of plastic, man. Why even bother? Where does the documentary go? There's festivals. It's doing the festival circuit, which mm -hmm. is so rad. And what's the reception been? I'm really loving what people have to say. It seems everybody has a different takeaway. Some people really appreciate the family stuff. Some people love the work aspect. Some people like to look at my my go-go boys. I mean, I know, you know, yeah, there's, there's a couple dick shots in there <laughs> that, that I had to pause. Just a couple. Uh, <laughs> Will you put these on? I'm not putting your socks on, what the fuck? Where's the heel? Oh, good, good. Seattle boy, find the heel. Find the heel. I think you got him upside down, but it doesn't matter. Just pull him all the way up and I'll fix him. That's why you guys always fuck up my socks. <laughs> Wear that blue. Will you put these on for a second, Papa? No. I feel like we're hiding your amazing cock. All right. I, don't know. I mean, I can see it quite well, it looks but good. it's not going to be well, flopping I mean, around. I'm I'll probably, you know, maybe have it to the side like that later. All right. I don't know. Wait. It looks good. Okay. If it turns me on, you know, I'll style a boy based on how I want to see him. Like, what would be really hot on that guy? At the end of the day, I do this because I love it, you know, and I, I want the environment that I want to be in. Um, a lot of daddy issues. How dare you? A lot of inner angst and turmoil that you're working your way through. You're constantly, you're a work in progress, of course. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. There's the heartbreaking moment where when he stopped looking in your eyes, mm -hmm. when you said you were gay, and that like just sort of cuts. I always felt a source of shame and unhappiness in his life, which I think many uh, gay boys can. Uh, boys and their dads are yeah. it's always, 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 yeah. there's always problems. And right? I always had great respect for him. My dad was really driven. He was really uh, amazing, strong. The dad, the dad thing is what hurt. It's what maybe did have me in the closet a little bit when I was a little gay boy. If I would have been the total lady killer and screwed as many girls along the way, I mean, I, he would have been <laughs> so proud of me. So I turned out you, you, kind you're, of you're, opposite. Right. Exactly. It's the same, opposite <laughs> end of the same stick is what it was. Um, of a very big stick. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm just grateful that he's mature enough now to tell me he's proud of me, to tell me he loves me, and I just, I thank him for it. And where all are you working? You're still doing Full Frontal Disco. Mm -hmm. Still doing Big Fat Dick. I am. What 12 else? 12 years, every Thursday night. Has it been 12 years? It's been over 12 years. It's the longest running weekly uh, boy party. One of the reasons why I was gonna say earlier that I didn't go to the cock a lot was because from 93 to 96, mm -hmm. those were real heavy drug years for yeah. me. Whereas the cock was like on the corner of art and sex, yes. I was on the corner of drugs and narcissism. Yes. I feel like you were rebelling against the club kid thing that was happening, that mega club. I was. I found great inspiration in so many scenes in New York, so many great bars. Squeezebox was mm -hmm. one of the mm -hmm. ultimate clubs, mixed rock and roll, Michael Schmidt and Miss Guy. I mean, they created something really special. Think of Jackie 60 and Mother and Dean Johnson and rock yes. and roll fag bar. Yes. I mean, you know, I don't want to take any credit on, you know, being of, of any great importance in the in the you know New York nightlife history. I'm proud of what I've done there, but there are so many people that have paved the way. What's the worst party you've ever thrown? What's the worst thing that's ever happened? This is a great question. Nobody's ever asked me that before. If you've ever thrown a birthday party or had a party at your house, you know that anxiety that goes with it. That is nobody's coming to my party. When there's oh, when, when the first few people come and you're sort of tap dancing to make them feel <laughs> yes. comfortable. Yes. Like, and I mean, after 25 years, and generally they're successful, you know, at some point that should go away. But does it? But it kind of does it. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of does it. I'm blessed. I've had very few uh, flops. Has Grinder killed the gay bar? 
there isn't that freedom and that we kind of got to experience back in the day where you really were fearless to express yourself and do whatever disgusting, weird, naked thing you wanted to. You didn't have to worry about anybody putting it on Facebook the next day. People, our people even at the clubs are on their grinder trying to make their hookups. The experience of really connecting with somebody, you know, looking into somebody's eyes, that's never gonna go away. So there will always be a place for mixers and people to connect. What are some of the filthiest things that's happened at Big Fat Dick? We do a sexy photo contest at BFD, so all sorts of shenanigans go on in the back. I don't spend a lot of time back there, so I wouldn't know. I've never been in a back room before. <laughs> hmm. Who do you think I am? Well, where do you go from here? Is this something that you continue to do? I just want to be present. I want to enjoy what, I, what I'm doing. And it's really about relaxing, taking it all in, and just being so grateful for what I have going on. Okay, so uh, it's in Vancouver next. Yes, Vancouver. And then? Uh, we got North Carolina, Seattle Film Festival. Okay, well it's always so wonderful to see you. Thank you, you so much too, for coming Thanks in. Thanks for having me. And be sure to check it out. Try and go see Club King in a festival near you. Yay, oh my god! <laughs> Woo!